Kumano, uh, called Issa Chan Tukuengla. I'm going to hand over to our Kumajwa from Mati Fajwa, to Mati Dangi. Kia ora tāpe. Ko te tīma tāma o te whakārunui, ko te wehe ki aia ki te wahinga. Ki ranga kōrero ki wauri uri whai o i o ki tonu te rangi me te whenua i te nui o tōna tāna o tōna tōna. Me mehi ki te whenua me tangi mō rātou kōki uke. Tāma o kōrero ki unga i te papa whenua e hora nei. Rangi toto ki te taku tai moana, tai mai hoki ki ngā mauna e tiwa nga i unga tēnei Kuhinga o tāmaki. Mā wai e te reanga ki puta ki te waita matā, ki puta atu hoki, ki ngā taku wai takatakahia, e ngā mātiu e ngā tuku nai ngā rāki i ngā rāki muri, a nei rā te reo mai o ngā ōngā ki whātu, ki te wai tūna ki ngā te whutu, ki ngā whutu. Ki o tātou manuhiri, te hunga e no hone. Te hunga e kawena i ngā momo tohutohu e pāna, ki te ture, ki ngā hononga mai i te whenua o i ngā rangi, i ngā manapo i manapo i ai e o tātou mātua tūpuna o te rātaha o te ao. Kia taka mai kia tātou i Aotearoa, i taro i te maru, i whakarite ai i rātou te hunga kōkio. Tēnei pamihia ki a koutou katoa. Te mema o tāmaka, sa me me kana, kia koutou ki e Judge Kerry Wainwright, kia koutou ki e Aja Kika, i nga hanga te e puti puti o Mati Whātua no hone. Nā reina, pana tēnei e whakatau noa i te tēnei kaupapa i tēnei noho, i raro i te maru o whakaritea mo tēnei wā. Tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, ki oro mai tātou katoa. Kia ora tātou katoa. Ladies and gentlemen, it is uh, indeed my pleasure and privilege and honour to be here and extend to you all a very warm welcome to what I understand is day two of this 800-year-old event. And uh, I'm certainly not a, uh, anyone of any um, status or certainly with any insights other than what I know about uh, the present and certainly into the future of what this all offers us as citizens of New Zealand. I'm particularly interested in learning about beyond, uh, not past, but more into the future. And uh, I just wanted, I'm, I'm not even going to attempt to translate what I've said in Māori, but wanted to extend to you all on behalf of Ngāti Pāts a very warm welcome up to the organisers and, of course, our illustrious uh, panel that we're going to hear from. So, enough from me. Tēnā koutou, kia ora tātou. Tēnā koe tami. You are very important because you make it a much nicer place for me to be in if you're here to look after me. So um, thank you, Nāti Whātua, for coming and uh, keeping an eye on one of the uh, slightly younger Nāti Whātua members. <laughs> five minutes younger, five minutes. So welcome all of you very much to this evening. Um, as you may be aware, we actually have some people who are watching us on camera live streaming. So I'd like to say kia ora to uh, the Fano down in Canterbury. Lovely to be in touch with you all. Um, I'd love to say you're looking great, but I can't see you. And I hope that the snow is not too thick on the ground when you try to go home later. So uh, kia ora and thank you for coming out on such a cold and wet night at both ends of the country. We've got a very interesting panel to talk to us tonight. And I'm going to uh, very quickly hand over to them to let them get started so that that gives us enough time at the end for questions and answers. Does that sound all good to you? Fabulous. So first of all, I would like to introduce you to Simon O'Connor, who is a Member of Parliament. He is here on behalf of the Honourable Chris Finlayson, the Attorney General. 
And I will hand over to you now. Thank you. Tēnā koutou katoa, ko Simon O'Connor takawingua, uh, te mema paramata mō tamaki, uh, mi te tia mana o te uh, komiti whiriwhiri ho ora. Uh, good evening and welcome, uh, Simon O'Connor is my name. I am clearly uh, not the Honourable Chris Finlayson. Um, he sends his apologies, uh, but can I just uh, say uh, at the start, uh, kamatua, thank you for your words. Uh, Ngāti Fatua. Uh, look over me in my electorate, and so wonderful to um, have you here uh, tonight. Um, the Minister has provided me some opening remarks as context, particularly for his absence tonight, uh, has asked me to read those to you, uh, and then he has what was going to be his speech, um, and I will uh, read that to you. So strange enough, when I start speaking about I, I'm speaking about uh, Chris Finlayson, uh, but it's a pleasure to be here and part of this evening. Uh, the Attorney General has asked me to pass on his apologies for not being here this evening. He has asked me to deliver his speech and the following message on his behalf. I am sorry I am unable to be with you in person to take part in this lecture series. I have been in New Plymouth today, initialing a deed of settlement with Taranaki Iwi, the seventh of eight settlements I expect to complete with the Iwi of Taranaki. The Taranaki claims are some of the most significant and grave against the Crown. They include war, the use of a scorched earth policy, confiscation of land, broken promises, and imprisonment without trial. It has taken a long time to reach this point. The first Waitangi Tribunal claim from Taranaki Iwi was bought by the Taranaki Māori Trust Board in 1987. The Tribunal issued its landmark report in 1960, uh, 1996, Fourteen years later, the Crown recognised the mandate of the Taranaki Iwi Trust and terms of negotiation were signed. Then, in December 2012, the Taranaki Iwi Trust and I agreed on the broad outline of the settlement. Today's initialing signifies the completion of the negotiations. Uh, and that's the opening remarks from the Minister. Uh, and now for his speech. At this point, I'm sure you're all very well aware that this year marks the 800th anniversary of the sealing of Magna Carta. Largely thanks to the work of the Magna Carta 800 Committee for New Zealand, there have been a number of commemorative events and activities across New Zealand, just as there have been in other countries such as Australia and the United Kingdom. In my capacity as Attorney General, I've held an essay competition and asked students to write about the significance of Magna Carta in New Zealand today. We received some high quality submissions and a student of this university, Max Ashmore, won the university student category. I also hosted a reception at Parliament last month to mark the occasion. At that event, I started my remarks by quoting uh, Lord Sumption. It is impossible to say anything new about Magna Carta unless you say something mad. In fact, even if you say something mad, the likelihood is that it will have already been said before, probably quite recently. He is right. Looking at the document in its original context alone makes it difficult to see how it still forms one of the cornerstones of New Zealand's constitution in the 21st century, especially because much of the original text of Magna Carta dealt with grievances specific to that time. There are parallels here with another cornerstone of our constitution, which also happens to be marking a significant anniversary this year, that is of course the Treaty of Waitangi, which turned 175 in February. In her address at the swearing-in of Justice Davidson to the High Court last month, the Chief Justice reflected on the anniversaries of these two documents and their importance to our constitution. The swearing-in of a High Court judge is a significant but under-publicised event, so I want to share with you some of what the Chief Justice said. To quote, Both Magna Carta and the Treaty arose in dramatic circumstances, which certainly fix them in the national consciousness. Both have their detractors. They are said to be misunderstood or misused through bad history or romantic thinking. It is true that in 1215 and in 1840, 
Many of the things now claimed for these documents lay in the future and were uncertain. But the big ideas they represent and their persistence in popular estimation speak to enduring values which transcend, transcend the politics and self-interest of the moment in which they came into being. Only one article of the Great Charter of Liberties remains in force in New Zealand, although that is only because most of the others have been developed in other measures. It is identified in the Imperial Laws Application Act as one of the enactments recognised by Parliament to be constitutional. The Treaty of Waitangi, sometimes referred to as the Māori Magna Carta, is not yet formally acknowledged to be constitutional, but that may be only a matter of time. For present purposes, what is of significance is that both charters were invoked in the courts from their beginnings. Magna Carta has been regularly cited since the 13th century in all jurisdictions which have inherited it, and as the treaty has been in New Zealand cases since 1840. 1840 marked the foundation of the New Zealand we know today. The meaning of the treaty signed that year has been the subject of legal, historical and political debate ever since. While the Treaty of Waitangi does not form part of the statute books, at a bare minimum, it was a guarantee the Crown would treat Māori with respect and honour and would deal in good faith. It does not seem too much to have asked back then, and it does not seem too much to ask now. Indeed, seeking to remedy the Crown's numerous breaches of its own treaty since 1840 forms the basis of my role as Minister for Treaty of Waitangi Negotiations. One of the greatest privileges in public office has been to work towards remedying the Crown's actions towards Ngai Tuhoi. Throughout the 20th century, the story has been one of Tuhoi being misled, ignored, and not consulted on decisions affecting their homeland. Even as late as 1954, just for example, the Crown established Te Urawera National Park, which included most of Ngai Tuhoi's traditional lands. The Crown did not consult Tuhoi about this and did not recognise Tuhoi as having any special interest in Te Urawera or its management. Tuhoi has always tried to approach resolution of its dispute with the Crown in a principled and determined manner. But up in Te Urawera, the messages were passed down from generation to generation about the unfairness of it all. I will never forget the elderly gentleman who said to me at Ruatoki in relation to the 2007 raids, I said to my grandchildren, it happened to my grandparents and now it is happening to you. The Tuhoi settlement legislation passed by Parliament in 2013 and has provided the foundation for a new relationship between the Crown and Ngai Tuhoi, a relationship in which I hope we will walk and work together for our mutual honour, dignity, advantage and progress. Through my work as Minister for Treaty of Waitangi Negotiations, I have great appreciation for the rule of law component in treaty settlements. The Crown, like any other party, has an obligation to adhere to its own undertakings. This is where we can draw parallels to a vital legacy of Magna Carta. The Great Charter has become a powerful symbol of the rule of law. It may not have been the original source of the principle, as Lord Sumption points out in his address, but today it certainly embodies the idea that everyone, including the lawmakers, should be held accountable to the same law. Like Magna Carta, the treaty has come to represent so much more than the mere wording of its original articles. The treaty is so woven through the fabric of modern New Zealand that it would be impossible to unravel the threads, nor would we want to. Like Magna Carta, the treaty was a document of its time, but remains a document of our times. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Simon. That was amazing. Uh, Simon is also on our Magna Carta committee, so I'd also like to acknowledge uh, the incredible hard work that he's done on that committee. And there's a few other committee members in the room tonight. It's lovely to see you all. So thank you, Simon.
We're going to move now on to our next speaker, and uh, the reason I've moved rather speedily into getting the speakers in front of you is because a few people said to me last night, there wasn't enough time for discussion at the end. So I do want to make sure that you've got enough time for discussion after the three speakers uh, have presented. Uh, for anybody who is live streaming, and also those of you in the room who would like to, there are uh, a couple of ways you can send questions if you'd rather not wave your hand at the end of the speaking. Uh, we've got Facebook and um, tweet addresses up there. I, I said that wrong, isn't it? Twitter? No, just Twitter. Thank you. They'll modernise me at some point. Look out. <laughs> so for our second speaker, I'm very pleased to introduce Judge Carrie Wainwright, who is here with us. Uh, Judge Wainwright, uh, we've got her on the program as my Tangy Tribunal, but in actual fact, she's had a very long and wonderful history of, of, of representing us with New Zealand, or, sorry, as New Zealand, in terms of the Māori Land Court, the Waitangi Tribunal, uh, and she's now at the District Court, where I understand uh, you're doing quite an interesting inquiry. I'm going to try and pronounce it their way. Hwanganui. Did I do okay? It's not bad, is it? Great. Whanganui District Inquiry. I must admit I am one of those people who always watches with fascination on television to see how they pronounce that. So many iterations, isn't there? So thankfully Ngāti Fata was slightly easier for me to pronounce. I'll stick to my own. Um, so really lovely to welcome you here tonight and um, thank you for coming to talk to us about uh, the Māori Magna Carta Waitangi and Beyond, Judge Carrie Wainwright. Uh, kia ora mai tātou. Whai hua ki au e nei uh, kōrero, e nei whakaro e pāna ki tērā pepa nui, te Magna Carta. Nā reira, he nui aku mihi ki a koutou katoa i runga i te āhuatanga o tēnei pō hōhonu. Thank you, Lisa. Thank you all for coming. Now, I could say many things about the Treaty of Waitangi because I have spent a great deal of my professional life thinking about it, but you'll be relieved to know that um, I'm only going to venture upon a corner of it tonight. And I should also add that I have not spent much of my professional life thinking about the Magna Carta. However, lately my contemplations have been trending in that direction. I have been toying with the idea that for some people, for some New Zealanders, it might be relevant or even cogent to look at our colonial past through a lens other than the Treaty of Waitangi. And I'd like to suggest that a possible alternative lens is the Magna Carta, which 800 years ago as we all know, introduced the legal norm that the rulers and the ruled ruled must comply with the same law. Now, this is a lens that is not unrelated to the treaty because in Article 3, um, Māori have all the rights and benefits of British citizens. And those rights, of course, include the brilliant and moral Magna Carta precept that the same consistent set of ascertainable laws applies to everybody. And that right there was an exit route from tyranny and became the cornerstone of democracy. So here in New Zealand, who are the rulers? Well, when the colony of New Zealand began, the uh, rulers were embodied in the person of the crown, which effectively meant the state. And in our colonial past, and even, dare I say, occasionally today, the crown has engaged in conduct vis-a-vis -vis te iwi Māori that the Waitangi Tribunal, in its numerous reports, has famously found wanting. Now, the Waitangi Tribunal, of course, doesn't apply the Magna Carta. It sets as a standard for Crown conduct the one that Parliament set, namely compliance with the principles of the Treaty of Waitangi. Those principles have a common root of good faith, fair dealing, and proper process. And I've been privileged over the last um, 15 years 
to be among those who've created uh, the jurisprudence of the tribunal uh, that has those principles as its core. However, there is no denying that for some, the principles of the treaty occupy a legal space that can seem amorphous, more amorphous than some lawyers feel comfortable with, because the principles come out of the vast power imbalance that has come to pass through colonisation and from the fact that the treaty essentially failed as a means of protecting the interests of tangata whenua. So those principles are political as well as legal and perhaps that is why their critics label them as airy-fairy and presentist and say that they're not firmly rooted in general legal principle. So I think it's useful to see that if you set the principles for now to one side and instead look at the failures of the Crown, the acts of the Crown that were most egregious, and we look at them through the Magna Carta lens, we see that we don't actually require any principles of the treaty to find those actions, those failures wanting. The situations arose because the Crown's representatives did not apply to the Crown and its transactions with Māori, the very law that underpinned the foundation of the new colony. Now, I've only got 10 minutes to address you on this topic, so I'm going to leap straight into examples that I hope will illuminate what I'm trying to talk about. And the examples I'm going to use come from the area of Whanganui, where I led the Waitangi Tribunal's district inquiry, and we're just coming to the end of the very long process of writing our report. Now, you all know there were huge purchases of land from Māori in the 19th century. And the incomers to these islands, the Pahia, saw land as the chief asset of Māori. But from the Māori point of view, and from the point of view of their culture, land defined who they were in terms of whakapapa and in terms of their creation through Papa Tuanuku, the Earth Mother. So by any standard, it was vital that the process of converting the customary land interests of, of a tangata whenua into legal title, and then subsequently their purchase, it was vital that that process was robust and fair, but in many cases it wasn't. The, col the colonists applied different standards altogether to acquiring Māori land than they would have applied to acquiring land that Pahia owned. And it was the Crown that conducted these huge purchases. The treaty made the Crown the only show in town when it came to purchasing Māori land. And that was a circumstance that put the Crown in a very privileged position, one that you might think would have placed on it an obligation to meet a high standard of conduct. But as it turned out, no. In Whanganui, there was a purchase in 1848 eponymously called the Whanganui Purchase. And the Crown acquired 89,000 acres. The Crown was actually following up on a shonky purchase that the New Zealand Company had negotiated directly with Māori before the treaty was signed. And uh, what happened was that a commission was set up to look into purchases that had happened before the treaty. And when the commissioner did that, he said that the company had bought 40,000 acres. So it fell to the Crown to conclude the purchase. The land was surveyed, and the Crown quietly expanded the area to 89,000 acres while paying the owners of the land for 40,000 acres. So where does the Magna Carta come in? Well, the Crown did not apply to itself English law applying to land transactions. The law required, as a minimum, that you'd have a willing buyer and a willing seller, that the parties would know what was in the bargain, and they would have the ability to negotiate the price. So even if we put aside the proper identification of who the people were who were entitled to sell the land, 
and that was always a tricky area for the Crown, who usually performed poorly. How could the vendors know what was in the bargain, that is, what land they were selling, when there had been no survey? And then when the survey was done and the Crown representatives realised that the true extent of the land was 89,000 acres, it paid only for 40,000 acres. And then if we move into the 1880s, by this time the colony was much better developed and arguably the uh, Crown had fewer excuses for engaging in poor process. It set about the purchase of an even larger area of land, and it was called the Waimarino Block. This was the biggest block that the Crown bought in the North Island. It was vast. It occupied 1,145 square kilometres, and it stretched from Taumarunui in the north to just south of Raiatehi to the summit of Ruapehu. And when the Crown set about buying up individuals' interests in that land, the block hadn't been surveyed. So the Crown did not, as the law said it should, wait for the Native Land Court to say which Māori owned which land, and it did not wait for a survey. The Crown purchase agents were under instructions to buy up as much land as they could as quickly as possible and as cheaply as possible for they needed that land for the construction of the North Island main trunk, which was at that time the foremost policy of the government. So the Crown Purchase Agents went out and they bought up interests from individual Māori for a fixed price at a time when the Māori owners simply could not know what they were selling because what they owned had not yet been defined. And so they didn't know how many interests they owned in the land and they didn't know where their interests were. The Crown agents would not tell the Māori vendors how much they were paying them per acre because the Crown agents didn't know how many acres there were. And they were under instructions to keep the price to a minimum. So they simply handed over to each individual interest holder an amount of money to cover whatever the interests were that they turned out to own. And in that block, in the Waimarino block, an unusually high proportion of the owners were children. Now, the law specified a process that involved the Governor General in Council appointing trustees for minors. But this would have taken way too long. So the officials asked the court to bypass the formalities so that the Crown's purchase activities wouldn't be delayed. And the agent, agents for the Crown brought up nearly all the miners' interests over the course of a few months from people who were not appointed according to law. So these two purchases, the Wanganui purchase and the Waimarino purchase in the Wanganui district, are clear examples of how the impact of colonisation, which if you look around the world you will note is always a brutal process for the colonised, how that was exacerbated when the Crown failed to regulate its own conduct in conformity with the norm that it too was subject to the law, the norm for which we have the Magna Carta to thank. So when we try to address the question, what did Māori get out of colonisation? The light of civilisation supposedly imported with the English should have had as its most intense and brightly burning part the light of the rule of law, a fair, impartial system of laws and obligations to which all were equally bound. And if the colonisers had maintained their focus on that gift of the Magna Carta, the worst treaty breaches that the Waitangi Tribunal investigates today would have been many fewer. Kia ora tato.
was so engrossed I forgot my paperwork. Thank you so much. That was intriguing. And I'm really looking forward to reading that report. <laughs> OK, I'll just stop shaking a bit. Fascinating. Thank you very much. Our third speaker tonight comes by a rather interesting route which he doesn't know about, so I'm about to tell him. So uh, the question was put out, who is a really amazing young Māori person with a you know, great sort of legal mind, respected by people of his own generation or her own generation? We were you know, equally looking for both genders. And this, dare I say young, I won't, this person uh, was the person that was most recommended uh, by people of his own generation, by professional colleagues, and by Māori. So I'm very pleased to introduce Isaac Hikaka, who is a partner at Specialist Dispute Litigation Firm, which I'm reading, because it's all one word, Lee Salmon Long. There are no spaces. Um, and he is uh, somebody that we hoped would, and I'm sure will be, uh, the voice of the future generation for those of us that are quite a bit older than him. So welcome, uh, Isaac. I hope you liked the story of how you got here. Kia ora. <laughs> Kia ora tato katoa, ko taranaki te maunga, ko autea te waka, ko ngārua hine te iwi, ko ngāti tumahuroa, te hapu, ko hikaka te whānau, ko oio te marae, ko Greg te matua, ko Jolene te whaia, ko Isaac Tamakitarangi Fionbara Hikaka Hau Te Hei Māori Ora. Thank you for the privilege of addressing you today on uh, Magna Carta and the Treaty of Waitangi. I was very surprised to hear my introduction and wish I'd heard it beforehand because then I could have disabused the people of the notions that have just been put to you about me. But th there have been a large number of speeches made about the Magna Carta this year from very learned persons. And it's already been pointed out today that it's impossible to say anything new about the Magna Carta unless one says something mad. Now, I do not suggest that I will say anything new, though there is a much greater chance I will say something mad. What I would like to do is suggest some links, or potential links, between the Treaty of Waitangi and the Magna Carta. And I'll address three aspects. First, I will suggest that there are a number of historical similarities in the treatment of Magna Carta and Te Tiriti. Both were signed in response to particular historic circumstances. Both then went through a period of being ignored or devalued, and both went through a period of rediscovery and reinvigoration, that period we are in now. Second, I will examine the notion of the rule of law and how it is important in both documents I will suggest that not only is the concept of the rule of law present in both documents, but the underlying principles of that doctrine would not have been foreign to Māori in 1840. And finally, I'll seek to illustrate an important difference between Magna Carta and the treaty, and suggest how this difference can be viewed in a more global jurisprudence of constitutional interpretation. So, Though signed centuries apart, there are some similarities in the historical stories, or narratives, if you will, of Te Tiriti and Magna Carta. Both were signed to address particular concerns and in particular circumstances, and it was these circumstances and concerns that framed the language of the two documents. In Magna Carta's case, the document was a temporary peace agreement between King John and his barons, and responded directly, though not necessarily comprehensively, to the concerns that had led to the rebellion in the first place. In its long and archaic text, littered provisions about taxation, river weirs, and repayment of dowries, some of which have precious little resonance to the modern audience, but had significant import to those feudal landowners who thrust the articles of the barons before a rapacious king in a muddy field. But just as the climes of Waitangi were, I imagine, much more hospitable than those of Runnymede, 
So too were the circumstances that led to the signing of the Treaty of Waitangi. There was no state of active hostilities between Māori and the British Crown that was to be resolved through the treaty. Rather, the Crown is likely to have seen the treaty as being for the benefit and protection of Māori from the ravages of lawless settlement in the French, though the British Crown might have seen little difference between lawless settlement and the French. And to the outside observer, the inherent self-interest in the Crown's position is obvious. But it was this context and attempt to obtain sovereignty by treaty that explains the character and language of the document, or at least its English, trans English language version. Of course, whether it actually achieved that aim of sovereignty, especially in the light of the recent Waitangi Tribunal report, is a much more vexed topic. The second stage of similarity is the ignoring of the two documents soon after their signature. In the case of the Magna Carta, it was only a matter of weeks before the terms were broken, and in a matter of months, it was denounced by the Pope. Though it was reissued, albeit in somewhat watered-down versions, uh, by successive kings uh, until 1455, it ceased having any practical effect until around the late 17th century, despite uh, extensive efforts of Edward Coke uh, in the early 1600s to buttress his challenge to an absolutist monarchy. In New Zealand, the active disregard for tetiriti throughout the early colonial history is well known. Though Chief Justice Prendergast's dismissal of the document as a legal nullity in the case of Weeparata and the Bishop of Wellington was less juvenile than Oliver Cromwell's dismissal of the Magna Fata, it was no less troublesome. Early colonial governments took many actions, some of which you've heard about already, uh, that were clearly in breach of the treaty. I mean, there's no sensible way to defend legislation such as the Native Lands Act 1865 as consistent with the treaty. But on a happier note, as alluded to earlier, we're now in a third stage of the process where both the Magna Carta and Tetiriti have been reinvigorated. In terms of Magna Carta, that can most obviously be seen by the fact that we are here celebrating its 800th anniversary Images of its ceiling adorn the doors of the United States Supreme Court and sit above the doors of the United Kingdom Supreme Court. While it may be that celebration of the document is more a celebration of what it has become more than what it was originally, this doesn't lessen its significance. Its position as a founding document in the Western legal system is secure. And so too, I say, has the Treaty of Waitangi emerged as the most important document in New Zealand's constitutional history. Its recognition through the legislature and the courts have enabled it to take a central position in New Zealand's political and social dialogue. It is a mainstay of our education system and a mainstay of our legal system. Though it has not obtained the same uncontroverted status in the minds of the New Zealand public as Magna Carta has in Great Britain, it is something that has been taken up by successive governments as a guiding policy toward Māori and something they've made extensive efforts to remedy the past breaches of. So on the topic of the rule of law, uh, Lord Sumption, who you've speech you've heard about earlier, in a recent address to the Franco-British Council Conference, noted that Magna Carta is one of those documents which is important not so much because of what it says as because of what people wrongly think it says. Now, notwithstanding that, even his lordship acknowledged that Magna Carta stands for the rule of law. Articles 39 and 40 of Magna Carta are justly its most famous clauses, and it is appropriate that they are the clauses that endure on the New Zealand statute books through Article 29 of Magna Carta 1297 and, Article, and Section 3, rather, of the Imperial Laws Application Act 1988, to prove that I know some statutes. The rule of law is most conveniently summarised as a principle as the requirement that power must be exercised in accordance with law rather than on a whim. Though not a principle created by Magna Carta, that document has become the touchstone for the principle in modern democracies stemming from Great Britain and Great Britain's colonial exploits. However, it is not a concept unique to the British legal tradition. As the Waitangi Tribunal has recently noted, 
Māori had their own system of laws and authority. The Māori system of law centred on the imperatives of tapu and utu, handed down by atua, but interpreted and applied in the temporal world by rangatira and tohanga. So where Article 3 of the Treaty of Waitangi guaranteed to Māori the rights and privileges of British subjects, including the rule of law, the translated phrase for that of tikanga katoa would have been recognised by Māori as a system of law and not a system of whim. The final point I wish to make is based on the difference between Magna Carta and Te Tiriti. Now, as I noted earlier, much of Magna Carta's importance is based on its mythic significance rather than its actual words. Though arguments have been made that in Magna Carta one can, if we adopt the words of Lord Nürburger, detect the green shoots of democratic government, freedom of expression and economic prosperity, in my view one has to strain very hard to actually read such grandiose proclamations into, the Mag into Magna Carta's text, the rule of law being an obvious exception. And I say that's not surprising. As referred to earlier, Magna Carta was a product of very particular circumstances, and those circumstances did not include a desire to make a provision for the majority of the British population. In contrast, the Treaty of Waitangi was specifically aimed to provide for all Māori, though not necessarily in a directly enforceable way. Though significantly shorter, Te Tiriti's words provide a more direct and broad basis for the recognition of a wider range of rights relevant to modern society than those addressed in Magna Carta. To this extent, I suggest that the Treaty of Waitangi can be seen as closer to being a foundational constitutional document, such as uh, the Constitution of the United States of America, than the actual Magna Carta document. Similar interpretation conventions should appropriately apply in reading to Tiriti in a manner that responds to contemporary issues as a living document, if you will. A recent example of this principle of interpretation, probably the most recent example, is the majority decision of the US Supreme Court in the Obergefell and Hodge, Hodges uh, decision, the uh, gay marriage decision. And that same principle is a convention that New Zealand courts and the Waitangi Tribunal have adopted. So whereas Magna Carta has developed its importance less through what it actually says and more through what it represents, the languages and circumstances of Te Tiriti are such that its importance need not be created through romanticism. Having regard to its position as a constitutionally significant foundational document, in my view it is appropriate to consider Te Tiriti to be akin to a Māori Magna Carta. Nō reira mauri ora kia koutou katoa. So what do you think? Did he live up to the hype of his peers? Yes, I think so very much. Well done, thank you so much. That was incredibly interesting. And, and actually, I think um, it came so much from the heart that uh, it made it even more impressive. So thank you all. I'd like to thank all of our panel members very much. I'm going to give you all a moment to just think about any questions that you might like to ask. I'm going to give Canterbury a moment to unfreeze themselves and see whether they have any questions they might also like to ask. They can send them through to us. And I'm just going to have a brief word with the panel, then I'll be back to take questions. Hope you just a moment. So we have some mobile microphones that can come around the room and we would ask that you use them just because it's easier for people in Canterbury to uh, hear what you're saying. If I have a question, do I have a question from Canterbury at all that, well, should we let the, the cold people down south have the first question, shaking in their furs down there? Does that sound good? Yes. The room for that was a good idea. Thank you. Uh, so this is a question from Canterbury. Uh, from Dr. Uh, Chris Jones of Canterbury University. Judge Wainwright, how would you describe the importance of the text in both Magna Carta and the Treaty 
compared to modern interpretations? Compared to what? Modern interpretations. Microphone on. Can people hear up the back? I can't hear because I'm down the front. We'll just grab another. Do I need to? Uh, I hold it <laughs> more closely. Sorry. Sorry, I told them that I would have turned them on. My apologies. No, that's <laughs> fine. Hey, um, what I was saying is that they were historical documents created in a moment in time to cr for a particular situation, and they have grown uh, in terms of what they are believed to have um, conveyed rather than what they actually were conceived to do at the time. I, I can speak particularly of the treaty in this regard because um, I know more about it. Um, so the, the treaty has become emblematic in New Zealand society as a document that is about partnership and the duty of the Crown to actively protect uh, the interests of Māori and um, to have good government for all its citizens. But it said nothing about that. So none of those words were mentioned. What it did was uh, guarantee in the Māori version, which is quite different from the English version, te tino ranga te of um, te iwi Māori over their lands and treasures. So most of what we say, the principles connote, is inferred from the language that was used at the time, which was really mainly about, in its essence, it said, we recognize that Māori own the land, and when they want to sell it, they have to sell it through the Crown. That, that was about the size of it, actually. There was some other language, but none of it was about partnership and active protection and act utmost good faith. We have derived from the situation, from what followed, um, that those principles were inherent in the document. And the same is true of the Magna Carta in, in the way that, that Isaac um, described that it was it was for a particular place in time but it's become resonant in other ways over time thank you would any of the other panel members like to make any comments on this question no we're okay Simon it's a good opportunity thank you are there any questions in this room sir thank you uh, my name's John when Hobson uh, proclaimed sovereignty over New Zealand um, in May 1840, um, and when the uh, Waitangi Tribunal um, concluded that Maori had not ceded sovereignty, it caused me to think, what sovereignty, what is sovereignty? So my question to the panel, and anyone can answer it, is, what is sovereignty and where is it located? <laughs> Go, I think. Sorry, uh, what was the last part? What is sovereignty and... Where is it located? Where is it located? Well, <clears throat> being, being the probably person who's the technical lawyer here, I'll give you a technical lawyer's answer. And sovereignty is the rightful lawmaking authority and... Where is it located? Well, at the moment, it is likely to be seen as located in the New Zealand Parliament as the lawful uh, lawmaker authority in New Zealand. So that's your technical legal answer. Uh, whether that's what you're after, I'm not sure, but the other panellists might be able to give a, a less dry response. I'm, I'm no lawyer. I'd, I'd go broader... Um, and speaking on my own behalf here very clearly now, not the, the ministers, um, I'd agree with uh, James's definition of it's around uh, who rules, who governs, who uh, structures things. Um, but I would argue sovereignty is ultimately something understood by the people. Um, I know that might go a little bit broad, but we as New Zealanders have to understand what we believe to be sovereign. And if you lose that will or understanding of the people, 
of who is rightfully there to, to rule, govern, um, we run into trouble. So ultimately, sovereignty has a very particular definition, um, who governs, who rules. Um, where is it? I would say it's in the minds, the perceptions, the understanding of the citizens of that country. Uh, and therefore, at times, it can be a contested idea as it uh, changes. So I hope that's not too broad, uh, but I don't think it ultimately, in my opinion, just sits in one place. Yes, Parliament manifests it, but it manifests it on the, on the will of the people. Uh, if I can just uh, address that briefly. Um, it's true, I believe, that at the time when uh, Captain Hobson declared sovereignty over New Zealand, there was no legal right for him to do so. And um, the actual legal measure uh, upon which sovereignty was uh, founded was a proclamation from the British Crown that took place uh, after the treaty had been signed and taken to some parts of the country. Um, however, all of that can be challenged um, through various ways of looking at it. I think my um, view is that ultimately the New Zealand government had sovereignty because everyone oh. accepted that they had sovereignty. Um, over the course of the 19th century, there were a number of occasions when Māori didn't like the way that um, the distribution of power under the treaty was working out. There were the land wars as one expression. There were a number of big hui all around the country where um, there was dissent expressed. But ultimately, it stopped being given expression to. And by the 20th century, it was accepted that the people who could exercise power were the people who were voted into parliament. Um, and in my estimation, sovereignty is about the ability to exercise power. Thank you. Do we have a question from Canterbury? They've gone, They've gone silent on us. They're probably running from the snow down there and I don't blame them. We did have another question up the back, I believe. Thank you. This um, probably follows on from that question. Um, what does the panel think is going to happen next as a result of the Y1040 report? Um, there seems to have been no response from, from the government about that. And, yeah, I, I'm just, I'd like to know what people think will probably happen and what should happen as a result of that report. You're speaking about the uh, Northland Inquiry. Yeah. Um, well, the Waitangi Tribunal's uh, jurisdiction is a recommendatory one. Um, the, the Tribunal hasn't recommended that the Crown do anything uh, thus far. It has simply put it out there that this is a way of conceiving of the beginning of our nation under which, um, according to that tribunal, um, sovereignty didn't pass to the Crown in the way that it's usually thought that it did. Um, ultimately, however, and, and I'm speaking really from, from my own uh, perspective rather than the perspective of, of the judiciary or the tribunal, um, it does boil down to who has the power to exercise authority. And uh, that power resides uh, with Parliament, and I think it's pretty unlikely that Parliament will agree to give that up. Yes, and I, I agree with that. I think that it's not going to have the sweeping effect of uh, creating a new constitutional regime in New Zealand. But it is likely to have a, or an emboldening effect on claimants in the Waitangi Tribunal. For example, I know I, uh, a couple of months ago, made frequent use of that in a recent pleading I filed on behalf of clients before that tribunal. So I think it will be used more in that way as a, another platform or another plank 
through which a position can be advanced. Look, I'd just add again, I, I don't speak for the Crown or the government um, in these uh, circumstances. As a parliamentarian, I uh, was very aware when this uh, came through, I must say, I have skimmed uh, the document, haven't engaged in it fully. Um, but as a parliamentarian, have had discussions with colleagues because this, I use the word lens, it's a new lens into how we understand ourselves. Uh, and so it's part of an ongoing conversation. I have to say, my, my own sense is that yes, Parliament's not going to cede elements of its sovereignty immediately, um, but I see that the, uh, I'm not sure the right, the right term, declaration, uh, what's been put out there is again part of a conversation uh, moving forward and I'd like to see that as part of that maturing around this whole uh, wider debate as we as a country begin to understand what the treaty means for us and yeah, that's what part of tonight is as well. Thank you. Sir, can we get a microphone down here? Thank you. Kia ora, Koto. Uh, thank you for three very interesting speeches. Um, I, in, I'm interested in whether there's any evidence that any of the chiefs had had contact with, um, well, or basically had knowledge of Magna Carta, because one of the clauses in Magna Carta, I think it's clause 61, it's referred to as the security clause, because the barons were suspicious that King John would not act on the previous clauses, so they had this... Uh, gang of 15 that would keep an eye on him. And I'm just wondering if, um, if the chiefs had had some contact or some knowledge of Magna Carta, they might have mistrusted the Crown slightly <laughs> earlier on. Um, I don't know. Uh, uh, 61 was the one that was quickly dropped from memory, wasn't it, in the first reissue and the one that the, caused the Pope to say, yeah, well, I'll denounce that, that's, that's an affront to God and nature. Um, so I, I, my, my gut feeling is that they probably didn't because they'd have had to have gone looking through an awful lot of history books to find that incarnation of Magna Carta. One of the things that um, is <clears throat> interesting when you look at the process of the treaty being taken around the Motu to the various um, tribal centres to persuade people to put their names on it, um, that the degree of interaction and detail in the discussion that happened in Northland where um, the Māori people there had had a prolonged period of interaction with Pākehā, the missionaries and the sailor, the sealers and the whalers and so on. And they sort of, they had a pretty strong sense of how the Pākehā did things. You take that situation to Whanganui where there were no resident Pākehā where there had been one visit of, um, of Pahia that had happened the previous year. So they'd met previously one Pahia who was a, a missionary. And when uh, that missionary, who was Henry Williams, took the treaty there, um, he had with him um, a translator. But no one kept a record of what uh, he said. Uh, but later, when that translator um, was taken before the Spain Commission who was investigating what happened about a land purchase where that translator had been used and the Maori people said they couldn't understand anything he said. And so Spain, the commissioner, got um, set up a situation where that, the, the interpreter um, had to speak in, in Maori and had Māori people there who all looked at each other and said, no, they couldn't understand what he said either. So the chances that anyone was talking about anything of remotely the sophistication of what might have been said by barons in England are nil. Uh, in fact, it's most unlikely that any of the key aspects of the treaty were... Um, canvassed at all, and Henry Williams would have known from his dealings with Māori that people like these, who had never seen Pākehā people, had no idea how they lived, had no context to put um, information like sovereignty into, um, and I don't think he would have tried. What he told them, we think, is that... Um, the Crown would protect them from land sharks. 
because the New Zealand company was there trying to buy their land. And Henry Williams, the missionary, was worried that it would all get bought up for nothing. Um, so that's probably about all that was said. And, and that, that, that kind of scenario um, contributes to the view of the tr tribunal that um, there could not have been an effective handover of sovereignty in situations where um, people probably didn't even know what signing was. You know, I mean, they'd never seen a piece of paper. So how did they know the significance of putting their signature on something? Probably it was just they were trying to please the white guy who was saying, you know, put your names here, and they, they wanted a trading opportunity. And so they were doing what he said because they didn't think that there was any downside. Hmm. Thank you. I think we have another question, do we, from Canterbury? Yeah. be our last question if we quote it. Yeah? Very good. So this question is from Canterbury, uh, from Lindsay Breach. Uh, her question is, do the treaty principles bind the Crown since it must consider them before passing legislation? Um, so I'll give a starter for 10. Um, do they bind the Crown? That They are a mandatory relevant consideration in any executive act. So are they directly binding and directly enforceable as if they were a statute? No. Are they something that must be considered by the Crown in a judicial review, say, a sense, or a good governance sense when a decision is made? Yes. And will they be enforceable on that basis? Yes. If in the appropriate circumstances. Um, again, I don't speak as a minister, but from my uh, uh, now second term in Parliament, um, the nature of the treaty and how it's going to affect legislation is again something that is discussed. It pops up in select committee and discussion in the corridor, certainly in the chamber in debates, it's, it's raised. So um, it doesn't have that formal structure, um, which Isaac was indicating, but it certainly plays a part of, of what of what we do, and uh, consequently there's a lot of debate at times around particular legislation um, of to what degree we are honouring, respecting or engaging uh, with the treaty. I, I just say that you only have to look at things like the foreshore and seabed legislation to know that Parliament is not under any legal obligation to take into account the principles of the Treaty of Waitangi. One interesting part of uh, what I've heard tonight, I must uh, add, and it's around the question of did the chiefs have any knowledge of what was happening around them. I want to remind us all that uh, one famous part of the events of the 7th of February, sorry, the 6th of February, 1840, was a statement by a person called Taunui. And Taunui said, let us take this document and sign it on the mana of the Kiwi cloak. Of course, the leadership of the time had other ideas. I suppose they would, one could make a comment about Kiwi feathers and another kind of feather that is very topical in Ngāpuhi at the moment. But the choice was made to have the document signed on the Union Jack. From that point, Abraham Atanui tilted his hat and said to Ngāpuhi, I will leave Ngāpuhi, I will go and I will locate myself amongst Ngāti Whātua. Now he has written, he had written a whole list of his accounts of what transpired in 1840 on the 6th of February, and we believe to this day that Abraham Matanui had some insight into what was behind and of course the whole connection with, with uh, governance and sovereignty uh, of, of the British people. So on that note, uh, thank you once again. Thank you to our panels and if you could 
give them all a big hand. And, of course, to those listening in and tuning in, live web stream, and of course at Canterbury University. Um, pity we couldn't connect Otago uh, to, to our discussions tonight, but uh, we'll leave that there for the moment and bid you all farewell on behalf of uh, the University of Auckland, especially Dr. Lisa Chant here and, and the organisers of, of this event. Uh, good luck to your deliberations and considerations as we move forward as a nation and uh, let's hope our descendants are here talking about the treaty in 800 years' time, um, <laughs> remarking on the foresight of their forebears. Tēnā koutou, kia pautirangi māni, tōra kātou.